Chapter 30 Art At this place of his towels, Beelzebub became silent, and turning suddenly to his old servant Ahum, who was also sitting there listening to him with the same attention as his grandson Hussein, he said, And you, old man, are you also listening to me with the same interest as our Hussein? Weren't you yourself personally with me everywhere on that planet Earth? And didn't you see with your own eyes and sense for yourself everything about what I am relating to her saying? Instead of just sitting there open-mouthed at my towels, you also tell our favourite something. There is no getting out of it. We have got to tell him all we can about those strange free brain beings, seeing that they have so intensely interested him. Surely you must have been interested in one aspect or another of these queer ducks. Well, tell us something just about that aspect. When Beelzebub had finished speaking, Ahum, having fought a while, replied, After your subtly psychological tale about all these unintelligibles, how can I intrude with my tales? And then, with an unusual seriousness, and preserving the style, and even entire expressions of Beelzebub himself, he continued. It is, of course, how shall I put it? My essence even was often thrown out of balance by those strange free brain beings, who with their virtuoso caperings, nearly always used to supply an impetuous for invoking the being impulse of amazement in one or in another of my spiritualised parts. And then, addressing Hussein, he said, All right, dear Hussein, I will not, like his right reverence, relate to you in detail about any particular oddity of the psyche of those free brain beings of our great universe who have taken your fancy. No, I will only remind his right reverence of one factor, the cause of which arose during our fifth stay on the surface of that planet, and which when we were there for the sixth and last time, had become the chief cause why, in every one of those favourites of yours, from the very first day of their arising until their formation as responsible beings, their ableness of normal being mentation is step by step distorted and finally transformed almost into a cold to Zara. Thereupon addressing Beelzebub himself, he, with a timid look, and in a hesitant tone, continued to speak. Don't blame me, your right reverence, for venturing to express to you the opinion which has just arisen in me, and which is the outcome of my reflections on data already perhaps worn too thin for mind conclusions. While relating to our dear Hussein about all the various reasons that have brought it about that the psyche of the contemporary free brain beings of the planet Earth who have taken his fancy, has become transformed, as you once deigned to express yourself, into a mill for grinding out nonsense. You scarcely even mentioned one factor, perhaps more important than the others, which, during recent centuries, has served as the basis for it. I intend to speak about that factor which has already become definitely maleficient for the contemporary beings, and at the arising of the cause of which You yourself were present, as I very well remember during our stay then in Babylon. I mean the factor they themselves call art. If you should consent in your wisdom to take up that question in detail, then, according to my understanding, our dear Hussein will have perhaps the choicest material for his better elucidation of all the abnormal strangenesses of the psyche of the free brain beings, who in most recent times arise on that planet Earth which has interested him. Having said this, and having with the tip of his towel wiped off the drops of sweat which had formed on his forehead, Ahun became silent and adopted his usual attentive posture. With an affectionate glance, Beelzebub looked at him and said, Thank you, old man, for reminding me of this. It is true that I have scarcely even mentioned that indeed harmful factor, created also by them themselves, for the final atrophy even of those data for their being mentation, 
which by a chance have still survived. All the same, old man, though it's true that I have not so far once referred to it, that does not mean that I have not considered it at all. Having still a good deal of time before us during the period of our travelling, I should in all probability, in the course of my subsequent tales to our common favourite Hussein, have remembered in its time about that of which you have reminded me. However, perhaps it will be very opportune to speak just now about this contemporary terrestrial art because, as you said, during our fifth stay there in person, I was really a witness of the events which gave rise to the causes of this contemporary evil there and which arose, thanks, as always, to the same learned beings there who assembled in the city of Babylon from almost the whole of the surface of that ill-fated planet. Having said this, Beelzebub then turned to Hussein and spoke as follows. This same, already definite idea there now existing there under the denomination art is, at the present time, for those unhappy favourites of yours. One of those automatically acting data, the totality of which of itself gradually, and though almost imperceptibly, yet very surely, converts them. That is, beings having in their presences every possibility of becoming particles of a part of divinity, merely into what is called living flesh. For an all-round enlightenment of the question about the famous contemporary terrestrial art, and for your clear understanding of how it all came about, you must first know about two facts that occurred in that same city, Babylon, during our fifth flight in person onto the surface of that planet of yours. The first is, how and why I then came to be a witness of the events which were the basis of the reasons for the existence, among the contemporary free brain beings of the planet Earth, of that now definitely maleficent notion called art. And the second is which were the antecedent events that in their turn then served as the origin of the arisings of these reasons. Concerning the first, I must say that during our stay then in the city of Babylon, after the events I have already related, which occurred among always the same learned terrestrial free brain beings assembled there from almost the whole planet, that is to say, after they had split into several independent groups and were, as I have already told you, already absorbed in a question of what is called politics. And as I intended at that time to leave Babylon and to continue my observations among the beings of the then already powerful community called Hellas, I decided without delay to learn their speech. From then on I chose to visit those places in the city of Babylon and meet those beings there which would be of most use in my practical study of their speech. Once, when I was walking in a certain street of the city of Babylon not far from our house, I saw on a large building, which I had already many times passed, what is called an Ukasmotra or, as it is now called on the earth, a signboard, which had been just put up and which denounced that a club for foreign learned beings, the adherents of legomanism, had been newly opened in that building. Over the door hung a notice to the effect that the enrolment of members of the club was still going on, and that all reports and scientific discussions would be conducted only in the local and Hellenic languages. This interested me very much, and I thought at once whether it would not be possible for me to make use of this newly opened club for my practice in the Hellenic speech. I then inquired of certain beings who were going in or out of that building about the details concerning the club, and when, thanks to the explanation of one learned being, with whom, as I chanced to find out, I was already acquainted, I had made it all more or less clear to myself I then and there decided to become also a member of that club. Without thinking long about it, I entered the building and passing my soul off as a foreign learned being, I requested as an adherent of legomanism to be enrolled as a member of the club. I managed to do this very easily, owing to that old acquaintance whom I had met by chance and who, like the others, 
took me for a learned being like himself. Well then, my boy, having thus become what is called a full member of that club, I used afterwards to go there regularly and to talk there chiefly with those learned members who were familiar with the Hellenic speech which I needed. As regards the second fact, this proceeded from the following Babylonian events. It must be remarked that among the learned beings of the planet Earth who were then in Babylon, and who were gathered there partly by coercion from almost the whole of the planet by the mentioned Persian king, and partly voluntarily on account of the already mentioned famous question of the soul, there were several among the beings brought there by coercion who were not, like the majority, learned beings of new formation, but who, with a sincerity proceeding from their separate spiritualized parts, strove for high knowledge only with the aim of self-perfection. Owing to their genuine and sincere striving to the corresponding manner of their existence and to their being acts, these several terrestrial beings had already, even before their arrival in Babylon, been considered initiates of the first degree by those terrestrial free brain beings worthy to become what are called all the rights possessing initiates according to the renewed rules of the most saintly Ashiata Shirmash. And thus, my boy, when I began going to the said club, it became quite clear to me, both from the conversations with them and from other data, that these several terrestrial learned beings who sincerely strove to perfect their reason had, from the beginning, kept to themselves in the city of Babylon and never mixed in any of those affairs with which the general mass of these Babylonian learned beings there of that time very soon became involved. These several learning beings kept themselves apart there, not only in the beginning when all the other learned beings who were then in the city of Babylon first opened a central place for their meetings in the very heart of the city, and when, for their better mutual support, both materially and morally, they founded there a central club for all the learned beings of the earth, but also later on, when the whole body of learned beings was divided into three separate sections, and each section had its independent club in one or another part of the city of Babylon. They identified themselves with none of the said three sections. They existed in the suburbs of the city of Babylon and scarcely met any of the learned beings from the general mass and it was only several days before my admittance among them as a member of this club that they, for the first time, united for the purpose of organising the club of the adherents of legomanism. These learned beings about whom I am speaking had all without exception been taken to the city of Babylon by coercion, and they were for the most part those learned beings who had been taken there by the Persian king from Egypt. As I later learned, this uniting of theirs had been brought about by two learned beings who were initiates of the first degree. One of these two initiated learned beings of the earth who had his arisen among, as they are called, the Moors, was named Kanil el Norkel. The other learned initiated being was named Pythagoras, and he arose from among, as they are called, the Hellenes, those Hellenes who were afterwards called Greeks. As it later became clear to me, these two learned beings happened to meet in the city of Babylon and during what is called their Ossi Paganumian exchange of opinions, that is to say, during those conversations, the theme of which was which forms of being existence of the beings can serve the welfare of the beings of the future, they clearly constated that in the course of the change of generations of beings on the earth, a very undesirable and distressing phenomenon occurs, namely that, during the processes of reciprocal destruction, that is, during what are called wars and popular risings, a great number of initiated beings of all degrees are, for some reason or other, invariably destroyed. And, together with them, they are also destroyed for ever, very many legomanisms through which alone various information about former rural events on the earth is transmitted 
and continues to be transmitted from generation to generation. When the two mentioned sincere and honest learned beings of the earth constated what they then called such a distressing phenomenon, they deliberated a long time about it, with the result that they decided to take advantage of the exceptional circumstance that so many learned beings were together in one city to confer collectively for the purpose of finding some means for averting at least this distressing phenomenon which proceeded on the earth owing to the abnormal conditions of the life of man. And it was just for this purpose that they organised that said club and called it the Club of Adherence of Legomanism. So many like-thinking beings at once responded to their appeal that two days after my own admission as a member of this club, the enrolment of new members already ceased. And on the day when new members ceased to be admitted, the number of those enrolled amounted to 139 learned beings. And it was with this number of members that the club existed until the said Persian king abandoned his former caprice connected with those terrestrial learned beings. As I learned after my enrolment as a member of that club, all the learned beings had arranged on the very first day of its opening a general meeting at which it was unanimously resolved to hold daily general meetings when reports and discussions on the two following questions were to be made, namely, the measures to be taken by the members of the club on the return home from the collection of all the legomanisms existing in their native lands, and for placing them at the disposal of the learned members of this club, which they had founded. And secondly, what was to be done in order that the legomanisms might be transmitted to remote generations by some other means than only through initiates. Before my enrolment as a member of the club, a great variety of reports and discussions concerning these two mentioned questions had already proceeded at that general meeting of theirs. And on the day of my entry, a great deal was said on the question how to obtain the participation in the main task of the club of initiated beings, of the followers of those so-called ways, then called onanjika, shamanists, Buddhists, and so on. Well then, on the third day after my enrolment as a member of this club, there was uttered for the first time that word which has chanced to reach contemporary beings there and which has become one of the potent factors for the total atrophy of all the still surviving data for more or less normal logical being mentation, namely the word art, which was then used in a different sense and whose definition referred to quite a different idea and had quite another meaning. This word was uttered in the following circumstances. On the day when the word art was used for the first time and its real idea and exact meaning were established among the other reporters, there stepped forward a Chaldean learned being, very well known in those times, named Aksharp Anasia, who was then also a member of the club for legomanists. As the report of that already very aged Chaldean learned being, the great Aksharpanasia, was then the origin for all the further events connected with this same contemporary art there, I will try to recall his speech and repeat it to you as nearly as possible, word for word. He then said as follows, The past, and especially the last two centuries, have shown us that during those inevitable psychoses of the masses, from which wars between states and various popular revolts within states always arise, many of the innocent victims of the popular bestiality are invariably those who, owing to their piety and conscious sacrifices, are worthy to be initiates and through whom various legomanisms contain information about all kinds of real events which have taken place in the past, are transmitted to the conscious beings of succeeding generations. Just such pious men are these always become such 
innocent victims of the popular bestiality only because, in my opinion, being already free within and never wholly identifying themselves as all the rest do with all the ordinary interests of those around them, they cannot, for that reason, participate either in the attractions, pleasures and sentiments, or in the similarly clearly sincere manifestations of those around them. And in spite of the fact that in ordinary times they exist normally and in their relations with those around them are always well-wishing in both their inner and outer manifestations, and thus acquire in normal periods of everyday life the respect and esteem of those around them. Yet, when the mass of ordinary people fall into the said psychosis and split into their usual two opposing camps, then these latter, in their state of bestialized reason during their fighting, begin to entertain morbid suspicions of just those who in normal times have always been unassuming and serious. And then, if it should happen that the attention of those under this psychosis should rest a little longer on these exceptional men, they no longer have any doubt whatever that these serious and outwardly always quiet men have undoubtedly also in normal times been nothing more nor less than the spies of their present enemies and foes. With their diseased reasons, these bestialized men categorically conclude that the previous seriousness and quietness of such men were nothing else but simply what are called secrecy and duplicity. And the result of the psychopathic conclusions of these bestialized men of one or the other hostile party is that without any remorse of conscience whatever, they put these serious and quiet men to death. In my opinion, what I have just said has most frequently been the cause why the legomanisms about events which really took place on the earth have, in the course of their passage from generation to generation, also totally disappeared from the face of the earth. Well then, my highly esteemed colleagues, if you wish to know my personal opinion, then I shall sincerely tell you with all my being that in spite of all that I have told you about the transmission of true knowledge to distant generations through corresponding initiates by means of legomanisms, there is now nothing whatever to be done through these means. Let this means be continued as before, as it has been on the earth, from the dawn of centuries, and as this form of transmission by initiates through their ableness to be was renewed by the great prophet Ashiata Shirmash, if we contemporary men desire at the present time to do something beneficent for men of future times, all we must do is just to add to this already existing means of transmission some new means or other ensuing from the ways of our contemporary life on the earth as well as from the many-centred experience of former generations in accordance with the information that has come down to us. I personally suggest that this transmission to future generations be made through the human what are called Afil Karna, that is, through various productions of man's hands which have entered into use in the daily life of the people, and also through the human Sol Jinoha, that is, through various procedures and ceremonies which have already been established for centuries in the social and family life of people and which automatically pass from generation to generation. Either these human Afelkana themselves, and in particular those which are made of lasting materials, will survive and for various reasons will be handed down to men of distant generations, or copies of them will pass from generation to generation, thanks to the property which is rooted in the essence of man of giving out as one's own, after having changed some minor detail one or another of the productions of man which have reached them from long past epochs. In regard to the human soul Jinoha, as for instance various mysteries, religious ceremonies, family and social customs, religious and popular dances, and so on, then although they often change in their external form with the flow of time, 
yet the impulses engendered in man through them and the manifestations of man derived from them always remain the same, and thus by placing the various useful information and true knowledge we have already attained within the inner factors which engender these impulses and these useful manifestations, we can fully count on their reaching our very remote descendants, some of whom will decipher them and thereby enable all the rest to utilise them for their good. The question now is only this, by what means can such a transmission through the various human alpha counter and soul genoha, as I have described it, be actualised? I personally suggest that this be done through the universal law called the Law of Sevenfoldness. The Law of Sevenfoldness exists on the earth and will exist forever and in everything. For instance, in accordance with this law, there are in the white ray seven independent colours. In every definite sound, there are seven different independent tones. In every state of man, seven different independent sensations. Further, every definite form can be made up of only seven different dimensions. Every weight remains at rest on the earth, only thanks to seven reciprocal thrusts, and so on. Well then, of the knowledge now existing which we have personally attained, or which has reached us from times past, just that knowledge which we shall agree is useful for our remote descendants must be indicated in some way or other in the said human Afal Kauna and Sol Jinoha, so that in the future it may be perceived by the pure reason of man by means of this great universal law. I repeat that the law of sevenfoldness will exist on the earth as long as the universe exists and it will be seen and understood by men in all times as long as human thought exists on the earth, and it can therefore boldly be said that the knowledge indicated in this manner in the mentioned productions will exist also forever on the earth. And as regards the method itself, that is to say, the mode of transmission through this law, in my opinion, it can be actualised in the following way. In all the productions which we shall intentionally create on the basis of this law for the purpose of transmitting to remote generations, we shall intentionally introduce certain also lawful inactitudes, and in these lawful inactitudes we shall place, by means available to us, the contents of some true knowledge or other which is already in the possession of men of the present time. In any case, for the interpretation itself, or, as may be said, for the key to those inactitudes in that great law, we shall further make in our production something like a legomanism, and we shall secure its transmission from generation to generation for initiates of a special kind whom we shall call initiates of art. And we shall call them so because the whole process of such a transmission of knowledge to remote generations through the law of sevenfoldness will not be natural but artificial. And so, my highly accomplished and impartial colleagues, it must now be clear to you that if for some reason or another the information useful for our descendants concerning knowledge already attained by men about past events on the earth fails to reach them through genuine initiates, then, thanks to these new means of transmission which I have suggested, men of future generations will always be able to reflect upon and make clear to themselves, if not everything now already existing, then at least those particular fragments of the common knowledge already existing on the earth, which chance to reach them through these said productions of the hands of contemporary man, as well as through those various existing ceremonies in which, by means of this great law of sevenfoldness, and with the help of these artificial indications of ours, we shall now put what we wish. With these words, the great Akshar Panasia then concluded his report. 
Considerable excitement and noisy discussion followed his speech among all the members of the club of the adherents of legomanism, and the outcome of it was that they then and there unanimously decided to do as the great Akshapanasia had suggested. A brief interval was then allowed for eating, after which they all assembled again, and the second general meeting of that day continued throughout the night. Well, the unanimous decision was then carried to begin the following day making what are called miniature images, or as the contemporary free brain beings call them, models of various productions to try to work out the possible and most suitable means of indication on the principles laid down by the great Akshar Panasia, and thereafter to bring these miniature images or models of the, of the club for exhibition and exposition to the other members. Within the following two days, many of them already began bringing the minia images they had made and showing them with the appropriate explanations, and they also began demonstrating every variety of those acts which beings of that planet before occasionally performed in the process of their ordinary existence, and which they still manifest up till now. Among the number of the models they brought and the various beanie manifestations they demonstrated were combinations of different colours, forms of various constructions and buildings, the playing on various musical instruments, the singing of every kind of melody, and also the exact representation of various experiencings foreign to them, and so on and so forth. Shortly after, for the sake of convenience, the members of the club divided themselves into a number of groups, and each seventh part, which they called a day, of that definite period of time which they called a week, they devoted to the demonstration and exposition of their productions in one particular branch of knowledge. Here it is interesting to notice that this definite period of the flow of time, namely a week, has already been divided on your planet into seven days and this division was even made by the beings of the continent Atlantis, who expressed in it that same law of sevenfoldness with which they were quite familiar. The days of the week were then on the continent Atlantis called as follows. 1. Adashika 2. Evosikra 3. Severokrisika 4. Midosikra 5. Mycosikra, six, Lukosikra, seven, Soniaksikra. These names were changed there many times, and at present the beings there name the days of the week thus: one, Monday; two, Tuesday; three, Wednesday; four, Thursday; five, Friday; six, Saturday; seven, Sunday. Well then, as I have already told you, they then devoted each day of the week to the production of one or another speciality, either of their hands or of some other form of consciously designed being manifestation. Namely, Mondays they devoted to the first group, and this day was called the Day of Religious and Civil Ceremonies. Tuesdays were given over to the second group and was called the Day of Architecture. Wednesday was called the Day of Painting. Thursday, the Day of Religious and Popular Dances. Friday, the Day of Sculpture. Saturday, the Day of the Mysteries, or as it was also called, the Day of the Theatre. Sunday, the Day of Music and Song. On Mondays, namely on the Day of Religious and Civil Ceremonies, the learned beings of the first group demonstrated various ceremonies in which the fragments of knowledge that had been previously selected for transmission were indicated by means of inactitudes in the law of sevenfoldness, chiefly in the inactitudes of the lawful movements of the participants in the given ceremonies. For instance, let us suppose that the leader of the given ceremony the priest, or according to contemporaries, the clergyman, has to raise his arms towards heaven. 
This posture of his infallibly demands, in accordance with the law of sevenfoldness, that his feet should normally be placed in a certain position. But these Babylonian learned beings intentionally put the feet of the said leader of the ceremony not as they should be placed in accordance with this law, but otherwise. And in general, it was just in all these otherwises that the learned beings of that group indicated in the movements of the participants in the given religious ceremony, by a conventional what is called alphabet, those ideas which they intended should be transmitted through these ceremonies to the men beings of their remote descendants. On Tuesdays, namely on the day of architecture, the learned beings belonging to the second group brought various models for such proposed buildings and constructions as could endure a very long time. And in this case, they set up these buildings not exactly in accordance with the stability ensuing from the law of sevenfoldness, or as the beings there were mechanically already accustomed to do, but otherwise. For instance, the cupola of a certain construction had, according to all the data, to rest on four columns of a certain thickness and definite strength. But they placed this said cupola on only three columns, and the reciprocal thrust, or, as it is also expressed, the reciprocal resistance ensuing from the law of sevenfoldness, for supporting the surplanetary weight, they took not from the columns alone, but also from other unusual combinations ensuing from the same law of sevenfoldness, with which the mass of the ordinary beings of that time were also already acquainted. That is to say, they took the required degree of resistance of the columns chiefly from the force of the weight of the cupola itself. Or still another example, a certain stone, according to all the data established there both mechanically from long-centred practice, and also thanks to the fully conscious calculations of certain beings with reason there, ought infallibly to have its definite strength corresponding to a certain power of resistance. But they infallibly made and placed this cornerstone so that it did not correspond at all to the mentioned data. But the strength and power of resistance for the support of the superimposed weight required on the basis of the law of sevenfoldness, they took from the setting of the lower stones, which in their turn they did not lay according to the established custom, but again they based their calculations on the manner of laying the still lower stones, and so on. And it was just in these unusual combinations of the laying of stones ensuing from the law of sevenfoldness that they indicated, also by means of a conventional alphabet, the contents of some or other useful information. This group of learned members of the Club of the Adherents of Legomanism further indicated what they wished in their miniature images or models of proposed constructions by utilising the law called David Brizaka, that is, the law of the action of the vibrations arising in the atmosphere of enclosed spaces. This law, which has utterly failed to reach the contemporary free brain beings of that planet, was then quite familiar to the beings there. That is to say, they were already quite aware that the size and form of enclosed spaces, and also the volume of air enclosed in them, influenced beings in particular ways. Utilising this law, they indicated their various ideas in the following way. Let us suppose that according to the character and purpose of some building or other, it is required that from the interiors of the given building, in accordance with the law of sevenfoldness, and with the mechanical practice of centuries, definite sensations must be evoked in a certain lawful sequence. Then, utilising the law of Davribrixaga, they combined the interiors of this proposed building in such a way that the required sensations were evoked in the beings who entered them, not in the anticipated familiar lawful sequence, but in some other order. And it was just in these deviations from the lawful sequence of sensation that they placed whatever they wished in a certain way. Wednesdays 
the day of painting, were devoted to the combining of different colours. On those days the learned beings of the given group brought for demonstration every kind of object necessary for domestic use made of such coloured materials as could last a very long time. Namely, they brought carpets, fabrics, chinkororis, that is, drawings made in various colours, on specially tanned leather, capable of lasting many centuries, and things of similar kinds. By means of variegated colours of threads, various representations of the nature of their planet, and various forms of beings also breeding there, were drawn or embroidered on these productions. Before continuing to speak about in which way those terrestrial learned beings then indicated various fragments of knowledge in their combinations of various colours, one fact concerning what I am just relating must be noticed, a fact definitely distressing for those favourites of yours, and which was also obtained in their presences on account of the same abnormal forms of their daily existence established by them themselves. First, I wish to explain to you also about the gradual change for the worst in the quality of the formation, in them of those organs of perception, which should be formed in the presence of every kind of being, and about the organ which in this case particularly interests us, the organ for the perception and distinguishing of what is called the blending of gravity centre vibrations, which reach their planet from the spaces of the universe. I am speaking about what is called the common integral vibration of all sources of actualizing, namely about that which the learned being Akshapanasia, of whom I spoke, called the white ray, and about the perceptions of impressions from separate blendings of gravity center vibrations, which are distinguished by beings as separate what are called tonalities of color. You must know that at the very beginning of the arising and existence of the free brain beings of the planet Earth, before the period when the organ Kunda buffer was interjected into them, and later when this organ was totally removed from their presences, and even after the second Transparnian catastrophe there, almost up to the time of our third flight in person to the surface of that planet, the said organ was actualized in them with what is called a sensibility of perception, similar to that which is actualized in the common presences of all ordinary free brain beings of the whole of our great universe. Formerly, at the periods mentioned in all the free brain beings arising on this planet, this organ was formed with the sensibility of perceiving the mentioned blendings of separate gravity centre vibrations of the white ray and of distinguishing one third of the quantity of the tonalities of colour of all the tonalities obtained in the presences of the planets as well as in all other greater and smaller cosmic concentrations. Objective science has already accurately established that the number of separate interblendings of gravity centre vibrations from the common integral vibration, namely the tonalities of colour, is exactly equal to one Horten Panes, that is to say, according to the calculations of the terrestrial free brain beings of 5,764,801 tonalities. Only a third of this total number of the blendings or tonalities with the exception of the one tonality which is accessible only to the perception of our all-maintaining endlessness, that is to say, 1,921,600 tonalities perceived by the beings as differences of colour can be perceived by all the ordinary beings on whatever planet of our great universe they arise. But if the free brain beings complete the perfecting of their highest part, their perceiving organ of visibility thereby acquires the sensibility of what is called Uroestidnokinian sight. 
then they can already distinguish two-thirds of the total number of tonalities existing in the universe, which number, according to terrestrial calculation, amounts to 3,843,200 differences of tonality of colour. And only those free brain beings who perfect their highest being part to the state of what is called Ishmech become able to perceive and distinguish all the mentioned number of blendings and tonalities, with the exception of that one tonality which, as I have already told you, is accessible to the perception only of our all-maintaining Creator. Although I intend to explain to you in detail in the future how and why, in the presences of the insupernalian cosmic concentrations, every kind of definite formation acquires the property from evolving and involving processes of producing various effects upon the mentioned organ of the beings. Nevertheless, I do not consider it superfluous to touch upon this question also now. It is necessary to say, first of all, that according to the completed result of the fundamental cosmic law of the holy Heptaparapashinok, that is, that cosmic law which was called by the free brain beings of the planet Earth of the mentioned Babylonian period the law of sevenfoldness, the common integral vibration, like all the already definitized cosmic formations, is formed and consists of seven what are called complexes of results, or, as it is also sometimes said, of seven classes of vibrations of those cosmic sources, the arising and further action of each of which also arise and depend on seven others, which in their turn arise and depend on seven further ones, and so on right up to the first most holy, unique, seven propertied vibration issuing from the most holy prime source. And altogether they compose the common integral vibration of all the sources of the actualizing of everything existing in the whole of the universe. And thanks to the transformations of these latter, they afterwards actualize in the presences of the cosmic in Sarpanian concentrations, the said number of the various tonalities of colour. And as regards the details of the most wholly unique seven propertied vibrations, you will understand them only when, as I have already many times promised you, I shall have explained to you in detail in its proper time all about the most great fundamental laws of world creation and world maintenance. And meanwhile, concerning the given case, you ought to know that when this said common integral vibration, that is, what the terrestrial free brain beings call the white ray, enters with its presence proper to it into the spheres of the possibilities for its transformation in the presence of an insarpanian planet, then there proceeds also in it, just as in the case of every already definitized cosmic arising, possessing the possibility of still further actualization, that cosmic process called Jarchklom. That is, it itself remains as a presence, but its essence, as it were, disintegrates and produces processes for evolution and involution by the separate gravity centre vibrations of its arising. And these processes are actualized thus. One of the gravity centre vibrations is derived from the others and is transformed into a third, and so on. During such transformations, this said common integral vibration, that is the white ray, acts with its gravity centre vibrations upon other ordinary processes proceeding nearby in interplanetary and surplanetary arisings and decompositions, and owing to kindred vibrations, its gravity centre vibrations dependently upon and in accordance with the surrounding conditions blend and become a part of the whole common presence of these definite intraplanetary or surplanetary formations in which the said processes proceed. 
Well then, my boy, during the period of my descent in person to the planet Earth, I, at first without any conscious intention on the part of my reason, and later already quite intentionally, noticed and finally definitely constated the progressive deterioration in all of them of this being organ also. Deteriorating century by century, the sensibility of perception of that organ also, namely the organ by means of which there chiefly proceeds the presences of the free brain beings, what is called the automatic cetation of externals, which is the basis for the possibility of natural self-perfecting, had reached such a point that at the time of our fifth stay there during the period called by the contemporary beings there the period of the greatness of Babylon, that organ of theirs could perceive and distinguish the blending of the gravity centre vibrations of the white ray, at most up to the third degree only, of what are called its sevenfold strata, that is, up to only 343 different tonalities of colour. Here it is interesting to note that quite a number of the free brain beings of the Babylonian epoch themselves already suspected the gradual deterioration of the sensibility of that organ of theirs, and certain of them even founded a new society in Babylon that started a peculiar movement among the painters of that time. This peculiar movement of the painters of that time had the following programme, to find out and elucidate the truth only through the tonalities existing between white and black and they executed all their productions exclusively utilising only the tonalities ensuing from black up to white. When I got to know of that particular movement of painting there in Babylon, its followers were already using for their productions about 1,500 very definite shades of what is called the colour grey. This new movement in painting there among the beings who were already striving to learn the truth, at least in something, made what is called a great stir, and it was even the basis for the arising of another and still more peculiar movement, this time among what are called the Babylonian Noxhomists, among just those beings of that time who studied and produced what are called new combinations of concentrations of vibrations, which act in a definite way on the sense of smell of the beings and which produce definite effects in their general psyche, that is to say, among those beings there who made it their aim to find the truth by means of smells. Certain beings who were then infused by this founded, in, in imitation of the following of the said branch of painters, a similar society, and the motto of their new movement was to search the truth in the shades of smells obtained between the moment of the action of cold at freezing and the moment of the action of warmth art decomposition. Like the painters, they also then found between these said two definite smells about 700 very definite shades which they employed in their elucidating experiments. I do not know to what these two peculiar movements then in Babylon would have led and where they would have ceased if a newly appointed chief of the city during the time we were there had not begun prosecuting the followers of that second new movement, because with their already sufficiently keen sense of smell, they had began to notice, and unwittingly to expose, certain of his what are called shady dealings, with the result that he used every possible means to suppress everything connected, not only with that second new movement, but with the first as well. As regards that organ of theirs about which we began to speak, namely the organ for the perception of the visibility of other cosmic horizons which were beyond them, the deterioration of its sensibility, continuing also after the Babylonian period, reached the point that during our last day on the surface of this planet, your favourites already had the possibility of perceiving and distinguishing, instead of the 1,921,600 tonalities of colour, which they ought to have perceived and distinguished, only the result of the penultimate what is called sevenfold crystallisation of the white ray, that is, 49 tonalities, 
and even then only some of your favourites had that capacity, while the rest, perhaps the majority, were deprived of even this possibility. But what is most interesting in respect of this progressive deterioration of that most important part of their common presence is the sorry farce that results, namely, that those contemporary free-brain beings there who can still manage to distinguish the mentioned miserable fraction of the total number of tonalities, namely, merely 49, look down with superior self-conceit and with an admixture of the impulse of pride upon those other beings who have lost the capacity to distinguish even this miserable number, as upon beings with abnormal deficiency in that said organ of theirs, and they call them diseased, afflicted by what is called Daltonism. The last seven blendings of the gravity centre vibrations of the white ray, then in Babylon, just as now among the contemporary beings there, had the following names. One red, two orange, three yellow, four green, five blue, six indigo, seven violet. Now here in just what way the learned beings then in Babylon belonging to the group of painters indicated various useful information and fragments of the knowledge they had attained, in the lawful inactitudes of the great cosmic law then called the law of sevenfoldness, by means of the combinations of the mentioned seven independent definite colours and other secondary tonalities ensuing from them, in accordance with that definite property of the common integral vibration, that is, of the white ray, during the process of its transformations about which I have just spoken, and which was already then familiar to the Babylonian learned painters. One of its gravity centre vibrations, or one of the separate colours of the white ray, always ensues from another and is transformed into a third, as, for example, the orange colour is obtained from the red, and further itself passes in its turn into yellow, and so on and so forth. So whenever the Babylonian learned painters wove or embroidered with coloured threads or coloured their productions, they inserted the distinctions of the tonalities of the colours in the cross lines, as well as in the horizontal lines, and even in the intersecting lines of colour, not in the lawful sequence in which this process really proceeds, in accordance with the law of sevenfoldness but otherwise, and in these also lawful otherwises, they place the contents of some or other information or knowledge. On Thursdays, namely the days which the learned beings of this group assigned for sacred and popular dances, they were demonstrated with the necessary explanations, every possible form of religious and popular dances, even those already existing which they only modified or quite new ones which they created. And in order that you should have a better idea and well understand in which way they indicated what they wished in these dances, you must know that the learned beings of this time had already long been aware that every posture and movement of every being in general, in accordance with the same law of sevenfoldness, always consists of seven what are called mutually balanced tensions, arising in seven independent parts of their whole, and that each of these seven parts in their turn consists of seven different what are called lines of movement, and each line has seven what are called points of dynamic concentration. And all this that I have just described, being repeated in the same way and in the same sequence, but always on a diminishing scale, is actualized in the minutest sizes of the total bodies called atoms. And so during their dances, in the movements lawful in their accordance with each other, these learned dancers inserted intentional in their exactitudes, also lawful, and in a certain way indicated in them the information and knowledge which they wished to transmit. On Fridays, days devoted to sculpture, the learned beings belonging to this group brought and demonstrated what was then called minia images or models, and which were made from the material there called clay. These miniature images or models which they brought for exhibition and familiarisation represented, as a rule, individual beings or various groups of beings 
either similar to them or of other beings of all kinds of exterior form breeding on their planet. Among these productions were also various what are called allegorical beings, which were represented with the head of one form of a being there, with the body of another and with the limbs of a third and so on. The learned beings belonging to this group indicated all that was requisite in the lawful inexactitudes allowed by them in connection with what was then called the law of dimensions. You must know that all the free brain beings of the earth, and also, of course, to the sculptures of that period, it was already known that, in accordance always with the same great law of sevenfoldness, the dimensions of any definite part of any whole being ensue from the seven dimensions of other of his secondary parts, which in their turn ensue from seven tertiary parts, and so on and so forth. According to this, each large or small part of the whole totality of the planetary body of a being has exactly proportionately increasing or diminishing dimensions in relation to his other parts. For a clear understanding of what I have just said, the face of any free brain being can serve as a good example. The facial dimensions of every free-centred being in general, and also the facial dimensions of the free-centred beings of the planet Earth who have taken your fancy, are the result of the dimensions of seven different fundamental parts of the whole of his body, and the dimension of each separate part of the face is the result of seven different dimensions of the whole face. For instance, the dimensions of the nose of any being are derived from the dimensions of the other parts of the face, and on this nose in its turn there are actualized seven definite what are called surfaces, and these surfaces also have seven lawful dimensions down to the said atom itself of this face of theirs, which, as I have said, is one of the seven independent dimensions composing the dimensions of the whole planetary body. In the deviations from these lawful dimensions, the learned sculptures among the members of the adherents of Legomenism, then in the city of Babylon, indicated all kinds of useful information and fragments of knowledge already known to them, which they intended to transmit to the beings of remote generation. On Saturdays, the day of mysteries, or the day of the theatre, the demonstrations produced by learned members of this group were the most interesting and, as it is said, the most popular. I personally preferred these Saturdays to all the other days of the week and tried not to miss one of them, and I preferred them because the demonstrations arranged on those days by the learned beings of that group frequently provoked such spontaneous and sincere laughter among all the other terrestrial free-centred beings who were in the given section of the club that I sometimes forgot among which free centred beings I was, and that being impulse manifested itself in me, which is proper to arise only in one nature beings like myself. At the outset, the learned beings of that group demonstrated before the other members of the club various forms of being experiencings and being manifestations. Then, later, they collectively selected from all that was demonstrated what corresponded to the various details of one or another already existing mystery, or of one newly created by themselves. And only after all this did they indicate in those being experiencings and manifestations reproduced by them what they wished, by means of intentionally allowed deviations from the principles of the law of sevenfoldness. Here it is necessary to notice that although in former epochs mysteries occasionally containing many instructive notions chance to reach some of their generations mechanically and sometimes pass from generation to generation to beings of very remote generations, yet those mysteries in the contents of which the learned members of the Club of the Adherents of Legomenism then intentionally placed various knowledge, calculating that he would reach beings of very remote generations, having during recent times almost totally ceased to exist. These mysteries there incorporated in the process of their ordinary existence centuries earlier already began gradually to disappear 
soon after the Babylonian period. At first their place was taken by what are called their Kejbaji, or as they are now called there on the continent of Europe, puppet shows, Pretrushka. But afterwards they were finally ousted by their still existing theatrical shows, or spectacles, which are there now one of the forms of that said contemporary art of theirs, which acts particularly perniciously in the process of the progressive shrinking of their psyche. These theatrical spectacles replaced the mysteries after the beings at the beginning of the contemporary civilization, to whom only a fifth to a tenth was passed down of the information about how and what these said Babylonian learned mysterists had done, began to think of imitating them in this also and set about doing, as it were, the same. From that time on, the other beings there called these imitators of the mysterists, players, comedians, actors, and at the present time they already call them artists, of whom I may say very many have sprung up during recent times. And these learned beings of that time belonging to the group of the mysterious indicated various useful information and the knowledge already attained by them by means of what are called currents of associative movements of the participants in these mysteries. Although the free brain beings of your planet then already well knew about the laws of the currents of associative movements, yet absolutely no information whatsoever concerning these laws has passed to the contemporary free brain beings. As this said currents of associative movements does not proceed in the presence of the free brain beings who have taken your fancy, as it generally proceeds in the presences of other free brain beings, and as there were quite special reasons there for this, proper to them alone, I must therefore first of all explain it to you in rather more detail. The process is the same as that which also proceeds in us, but it proceeds in us when we are intentionally resting to allow the whole functioning of our common presence freely to transform, without hindrance by our will, all the varieties of being energy required for our all-round active existence. Whereas in them these said various being energies can now arise only during their total inactivity, that is, during what they call their sleep, and then of course only after a fashion. Owing to the fact that they, like every other free brain being of the whole of our great universe, have three separate independent spiritualized parts, each of which has, as a central place for the concentration of all its functioning, a localization of its own, which they themselves call a brain, all the impressions in their common presences, whether coming from without or arising from within, are also perceived independently by each of these brains of theirs in accordance with the nature of these impressions. And afterwards, as it is also proper to proceed in the presences of every kind of being without distinction of brain system, these impressions, together with previous impressions, compose the total, and thanks to occasional shocks evoke in each of these separate brains an independent association. So, my boy, from the time when these favourites of yours completely ceased consciously to actualise in their common presences the being part dog duty, thanks only to the results of which what is called sane comparative mentation, as well as the possibility of conscious active manifestation, can arise in beings from various associations, and from the time when their separate brains, associating now quite independently, begin engendering in one and the same common presence three differently sourced being impulses, they then, thanks to this, gradually, as it were, acquire in themselves three personalities having nothing in common with each other in respect of needs and interests. Rather more than half of all the anomalies arising in the general psyche of your favourites, particularly those of recent times, are due in the first place to their having in their entire presence a process of three different kinds of independent associations invoking in them the being impulses of three localizations of different kinds and of different properties. And secondly, because there is a connection between these three separate localizations in them 
as there is also in general in the presences of every kind of free brain being, predetermined by great nature for other what are called common present functioning, and thirdly, because from everything perceived and sensed, that is from every kind of shock, associations of three different kinds of impressions proceed in the three said localizations, in consequence of which three totally different kinds of being impulses are evoked in one and the same whole presence. Then, on account of all this, a number of experiencings are nearly always proceeding in them at one and at the same time, and each of these experiencings by itself evokes in the whole of their being an inclination for a corresponding manifestation, and in accordance with the definite parts of their total presence, a corresponding movement is thus actualized. Just these said differently sourced associative experiencings proceed in their common presences and ensue from the other also in accordance with the same law of sevenfoldness. The learned members of the club of the adherents of legomanism, belonging to this group then in Babylon, indicated what they wished in the movements and in the actions of the participants in the mysteries in the following way. For instance, suppose that in order to fulfil his role in the given mystery, according to lawful association, a participant evoked in one or another of his brains some new impression or other, he was bound to react by some or other definite manifestation or movement, but he would intentionally produce this manifestation or movement not as he ought to have produced it, according to the law of sevenfoldness, but otherwise, and in these otherwises they inserted in a certain way whatever they considered necessary for transmission to distant generations. In order, my boy, that you should have a concrete representation of these Saturday demonstrations, at which I was always glad to be present in order to rest from my intense activities at that time, I will give you an illustrative example of how these learned mysterists demonstrated before the other learned members of the club of the adherents of legomanism various being experiencings and manifestations according to the flow of associations from among the number of which fragments for future mysteries were selected. For these demonstrations, they constructed in one of the large halls of the club a specially raised place which they then called the reflector of reality. But beings of subsequent epochs to whom the information concerning these Babylonian learned mysteries chanced to be transmitted, and who began imitating them and doing as it were the same, called and still call their constructions of a similar kind stages. Well then, two of the participants would always come upon these reflectors of reality or stages. First, and then usually one of them stood for a while and, as it were, listened to his own what is called dart hellalustinian state, or as it is sometimes otherwise said, to the state of his own inner associative, general, psychic experiences. Listening in this way, he would make it clear to his reason, for instance, that the sum total of his associating experiencings emerged in the form of an urgent inclination to hit another being in the face, the sight of whom had always served as the cause for the beginning of the association of those series of impressions present in him which had always invoked in his general psyche disagreeable experiencings offensive to his own self-consciousness. Let us suppose that these disagreeable experiencings always proceeded in him when he saw someone who was then called Irodo Hahun, which professional their contemporary beings now call a policeman. Having then made this dart hell hulistinian psychic state, an inclination of his clear to his reason, but at the same time being on the one hand well aware that in the existing conditions of external social existence it was impossible for him to gratify his inclination to the full, and on the other hand being already perfected by reason and being well aware of his dependence on the automatic functioning of the other parts of his common presence, he clearly understands that on the gratification of this inclination of his depends the fulfilment of some imminent and important being duty of his, of great importance to those around him. 
and having thought over everything in this way, he decides to gratify this urgent inclination of his as best he can by at least doing a moral injury to that Iro de Hohon by invoking in him associations that would lead to unpleasant experiences. With this object in view, he turns to the other learned being who has come onto the stage with him and treating him now as an Irod Ohohun, or policeman, he would say, Hi, you, don't you know your duty? Don't you see that there, pointing with his hand at that moment in the direction of another small room of the club, where were the other participants of the demonstrations of that day? Two citizens, a soldier and a cobbler, are fighting in the street and disturbing the public peace, and here you are, leisurely strolling about, imagining yourself God knows who, and leering at the passing wives of honest and respectable citizens. Just you wait, you scamp. Through my chief, the city's chief position, I shall report to your chief your negligence and breach of duty. From that moment, the learned being who had spoken would become a physician, because he had chanced to call his chief the head physician of the city, while the second learned being, whom the former had called a policeman, would assume the role of a policeman. Two other participating learned beings were then immediately called from the other room by the one who assumed the role of policeman, and they assumed the roles of cobbler and soldier respectively. And these two latter learned beings assumed and had to manifest themselves in just those roles, namely one in the role of a soldier and the other in the role of a cobbler, only because the first learned being, having himself in accordance with his dart hellhulustinian state, assumed the role of a physician, had called them soldier and cobbler respectively. Well then, these three learned beings who were thus cast impromptu by the fourth learned being for fulfilling every kind of perception and manifestation which had to flow by law of types foreign to them, or as your favourites say, of strange roles, namely of the roles of cobbler, soldier and policeman, further produced their experiencings and from them, their reflex manifestations, thanks to the being property in them called I Krill Ataz Kra Kra, a property also well known to the learned beings of the planet Earth of that period, who were already able to perfect their presences up to the ableness of actualizing this property. Free centered beings can acquire this said being property called I Krill Ataz Kra Kra only if there is already personally acquired in their presences what is called S-O-R-E-N-T-N-U-R-I-N-S-I-N will, which in its turn can be obtained thanks to always the same being part dog duty, that is, to conscious labours and intentional sufferings. So it was in this way that the learned members of the group of the mysterious, then in Babylon, became players of strange roles and demonstrated before the other learned members of the club the experiencings and the actions ensuing from them, which were produced in accordance with the directing of their well-informed reason. And thereafter, as I have already said, they, together with the other learned members of the club of the adherents of Mlegomanism, who were present, selected the corresponding for their aim from among the being impulses, demonstrated in such a way which according to the law of the flowing of different sourced associations had to be experienced and manifested in the definite actions of the beings, and only then did they include those selected in the details of some mystery or other. Here it is very important to emphasise that then in Babylon the free-brain learned beings who belonged to the group of the mysterious did indeed reprodu reproduce in action amazingly well and accurately the subjective particularities of the perceptions and manifestations of various types foreign to them. They reproduced them well and accurately, not only because, as I have already explained, they possess the being property I cruel tars kakra, but also because the learned beings of the planet Earth of that time were very well aware of what is called the law of typicality and that the free brain beings of their planet are ultimately formed into 27 different definite types, and also in which cases what had to be perceived 
and how it had to be perceived, and how they had to manifest themselves. Concerning the said being property I have just called I cruel Tars Kakra, I must add further that just this property alone gives beings the possibility of restraining themselves within the limits of all these impulses and promptings which are evoked at any given moment in their common presences by the associations flowing in that brain in which they themselves have consciously given the start for the associations of one or another series of impressions already present in them. And it is only thanks to this property that beings have the possibility of perceiving every kind of detail of the psyche of the type they have already previously well studied and of manifesting themselves similarly to it and fully impersonating it. In my opinion, it is on account of the absence of just that property that the majority of all these anomalies have arisen which have resulted in the free brain beings of the planet Earth who have taken your fancy becoming possessed of such a strange psyche. You must know that in the presences of the free brain beings of the present time, as well as in the presences of every kind of free brain being in general, every new impression is accumulated in all their three separate brains in the order of what is called kindredness, and afterwards they take part with the impressions already previously registered in the associations invoked in all these three separate brains by every new perception in accordance with and in dependence upon what are called the gravity centre impulses present at the given moment in their whole presence. 